All right, let's get started. We're running a little late, so uh, I'm going to try not to talk too fast, but I got to make up some time here. So, uh, welcome to uh, SBOMBs the Hard Way uh, for my adventures in hacking Bob the Minion. Um, I am the Product Security Research and Analysis Director and Services Team Lead at a fun company called Finite State. Uh, and uh, we do all sorts of fun stuff with SBOMBs and a whole bunch of other stuff. But I'm not here to talk to you about our product or any of that. I'm talking about my adventure with Bob. All right, so who am I? Um, I am a reformed penetration tester and reformed crossed out. Uh, I left doing penetration testing uh, to go do some thought leadership and some other uh, hardware hacking and IoT bunch of stuff. And three months into the job, my boss came to me and said, hey, we have a customer that wants to throw a lot of money at us to do pen tests. Can you do it? Are you signing my paycheck? Yes, I can do that. So uh, I am a reformed penetration tester back doing penetration testing back in OT, ICS, IoT, uh, and lots of hardware. Uh, I'm also the co-host of uh, Paul's Security Weekly. Uh, we're in our 19th year, soon to go into our 20th year of a weekly security podcast. How many of you are listeners? Go listen, All right? Awesome, thank you. Uh, I do a lot of work with SANS. Uh, I'm both uh, an instructor uh, and a course author around uh, wireless hacking and IoT hacking, irony, the ironically. Uh, I'm a recent convert to the Oxford comma uh, because commas save lives, folks. Okay. Um, and uh, someone said, why are you been using that Oxford comma for a really long time? So you're really not a recent convert. So, but I'm going to keep it. So I'll add that uh, I also enjoy long walks on the beach weighed down by my ham radio. Yeah, I'm pre prepping for the zombie apocalypse. Okay. All right. So let's get into some fun, fun bits here. Uh, so we're going to hack Bob the Minion. So on every one of my slides, except this one, features AI generated art with minions. So let's get into character a little bit here. And I took this image of my headshot and fed, fed it to Mid Journey so that I could become an evil, despicable me villain. So here we go. This is some of this art is terrifying. And, and I kept the ones that were insane just because insanity. I didn't know yesterday that there was uh, an AI generated art competition. My, oh, I would have been good at that. Maybe. So uh, I had lots of fun. I think I put more time into the art than the actual words on this on these slides. Don't get me wrong. This I think the presentation is really good. And you're going to get something from it. All right. So a little bit of background. Uh, I work for a company. We do S bombs and a whole bunch of other stuff. But uh, I really think that S bombs are fun. And that was sort of my end goal was to get a software bill of materials for Bob the Minion. Um, so a little bit of background. Um, a software bill of materials is an inventory of all your software, their versions, and, and who wrote it, where it came from, uh, as part of your product security, uh, sorry, your software supply chain, uh, and can help you do some security. And uh, we're going to start seeing somewhere around 2025 that every product that you, connected product that you buy, either at your company or for your personal consumption, will have an SBOM associated with it uh, and will be available as part of some of its certification process and being able to be sold into the marketplace. Uh, specifically uh, addressing some of those here in the United States are Executive Order 14208 um, for a lot of uh, stuff going into government and into consumer stuff. Uh, 524B for the FDA. So any medical device that is being submitted to the FDA for use on humans uh, requires that an SBOM is part of their submission process and a plan for securing their devices over time and managing vulnerabilities. Uh, and a voluntary program managed by the FCC here in the U.S., the Cyber Trust Mark Program. Uh, it's kind of like a consumer protection thing so that um, as a voluntary program, uh, that companies can submit their uh, devices to the Cyber Trust Mark program, they can get a stamp on the box, and that a consumer can have a high degree of confidence that there is some security in this product baked in, and that they are monitoring for vulnerabilities over time and, uh, and issuing some updates with a little barcode that links to a website that gives them an overall security store score. So while you're standing at Best Buy, you can scan this barcode and go, oh, this router's got a three for security, and that one's got a nine. Nine being better? Yeah, I'm going to buy the one that's a nine. Cool. Um, the one that is absolutely uh, both fascinating and terrifying, in my opinion, is the uh, EU Cyber Resiliency Act, 
uh, or the EU CRA. Uh, EU CRA, uh, their intent um, in the EU is that they do not want any connected products being sold into the marketplace that has any vulnerabilities. Uh, and they also need to have a process for managing vulnerabilities and patching and, and monitoring and all this type of stuff. And an SBOM will be included as part of that process. Um, and they are significantly more stringent. And this is not a voluntary program. It's mandatory if you want to sell into Europe. And companies that sell into the US also sell into Europe. Same device. So many manufacturers are going to have to submit to EU CRA, which means everywhere on the planet will largely benefit from those regulations. Okay. Overall, some general benefits uh, outside of any of the regulatory stuff for software bill materials. Uh, they give us that software inventory list uh, for both both uh, first and third party stuff that you're developing and stuff that you've pulled in uh, as part of your development process and even into potential final firmware that you're delivering to your customers or you are consuming. With that list of those components and their versions, you can perform some enrichment uh, on those, uh, find out whether there are vulnerabilities associated with those products so that you can then uh, attempt to perform some risk mitigation and uh, observe that some of that risk exists and, and take appropriate actions. Uh, and I'll also argue that you should be operationalizing uh, your SBOMs as either a consumer or a manufacturer, that you should take these software bill of materials and use them as part of your security process and your penetration testing process, uh, because knowing the components may give you an opportunity uh, to improve that security, knowing that their vulnerabilities exist. Uh, and that was the subject of my talk that I did at RSA entitled uh, SBOMs for Evil. Uh, so you can go check that out as well. So we won't go too far into that. So as part of my day job and as part of being a re reformed, unreformed penetration tester, I really love uh, software bill of materials. And some of the fun stuff that I get to do at work is go find some random device, get the firmware, and make it a, get an S-bomb for it just to see what they're see if we can do some accurate detection helps build build some of the things that we're detecting for helps improve our product and quite honestly i think it's really fun and find all sorts of sort of scary things so getting that firmware doing some extraction verifying that the extraction is is accurate for our product figuring out all new things going back and re reverse engineering some binaries uh to figure out the type of code and some of the code vulnerables and as a result of that SBOM, being able to discover that there's a product with a firmware that has some known vulnerabilities and known is here in uh, air quotes and that it's known to the community that these components have vulnerabilities, but maybe as a consumer or maybe even as a manufacturer, you may not realize that these components have vulnerabilities and they're using them in your, uh, your products. So uh, occasionally we get to find some, some O'Day and some other occasional uh, hackery uh, and discovering some surprises. And we may have some surprises here uh, with Bob the Minion. Uh, and arguably it might not be all that surprising after all. Okay. Ultimately, I think the end result is so much fun and arguably I get to come talk to you about it at DEF CON. So finding all of those uh, weird uh, products uh, suddenly a wild Bob appears. And yes, AI generated uh, Bob in a dystopian future uh, and hasn't shaved in a little bit. Uh, he might look a little bit like me. I'm kind of disturbed about that. Um, so suddenly a wild Bob appears. So what is this Bob? Uh, this Bob is a uh, wireless home router, the Davolink AX1800. Uh, and it has been licensed uh, by Universal uh, for Davolink to produce these wireless routers that are in the shape of Bob. It's a nice plastic fun looking case around a wireless router for your home. I was like, that's pretty cool. Uh, it's pretty darn good features for the price. Uh, Bob has Wi-Fi 6, um, has some uh, easy mesh support and supports WPA3. So some of our uh, latest Wi-Fi standards for, uh, for your home. Uh, now, I've been doing some hardware hacking around consumer routers for a really, really long time. Uh, and uh, it was typical that we were seeing devices with flash and RAM of somewhere between four and eight megs, maybe 16. Um, yeah, we've come a long way. Uh, this particular one has, according to uh, the box and Amazon, 128 megs of flash and uh, 256 megs of RAM. That's pretty darn robust and compared to some of the stuff that I've seen uh, in the past. Uh, but 
it, it gets better. It's not 128 megs of flash. We'll see that in a little bit here. Uh, currently, there's no open wart support, so it is their own custom firmware. Big thumbs down from Mick down front here. Uh, and they run about $70 on Amazon. So I didn't feel too bad about buying one of these things and ripping Bob's head off to see what was inside. Um, I did not purchase uh, the Kevin variety. The Kevin variety uh, is a little bit taller. Um, and one of the upgrades there is it does have Wi-Fi 6E, so into the 6 gigahertz range. Uh, but they're about double the price. And, well, this is coming out of my own personal budget. So I went for the cheap one, right? I figure that many of the challenges will probably be the same here. All right. So, hey, I want firmware, right, for these devices so I can generate some SBOMs. Let's go get the firmware. But you, you, I tip my hat a little bit here. What firmware? All right. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to easily locate firmware for the Devilink uh, AX1800. Uh, we powered the device up, used it, figured out what all the interface was about, logged in, take a look at the web interface. And sure enough, in the web interface, there is a button that says check for updates. And as of two weeks ago, when I pressed the check for updates button, there were no updates. There is one version of firmware for this device, the one that came on it from the factory which will be terrifying when we see this a little bit later. And so there's one version of the firmware. Uh, it is what it is. There's no updates, which means if I click the update button, there's no firmware, which means I can't capture anything off the wire. I can't get anything via web inspection or TCP dump or any of that type of stuff to try to recover the firmware from network traffic. Oh, well, I'll go to the website. Nope. Nothing on their website. You go to their support forums, you go to their support pages. Absolutely no firmware for the AX1800 uh, available for download. There's manuals and stuff, uh, but no firmware. So what happens if I brick it by accident? I have no way to upload firmware to this because the manufacturer doesn't even make it available. Uh, I checked the support forums to see if I could find links somewhere in the support forums, and that was a mess. Uh, it's a Devilink is a Korean company. They have two different support forums. Uh, one is in Korean, one is in English. Uh, the English has a little bit more population to it uh, in that more folks have asked some questions. Uh, the Korean version of the support forums, there's like three posts and that's it. Um, clearly Korea was not their intended market for these devices. Um, and Google Translate had a really easy time trying to go through uh, and translate that stuff because there wasn't a, a wasn't a lot there. Um, search through all of the uh, support forum posts. There are no links to firmware. There's nobody even asking, hey, I bricked my router. Can I get a copy of the firmware um, so that I could reach out to them and try to ask them for it or try that same guys? Um, and uh, no, so nobody was asking and nobody was offering. Unfortunately, now that means with no ready access to the firmware, we've got to go do this the hard way uh, and no access ready access to firmware that mean no wrong way that means no no s bomb no enrichment no ability for me to figure out if there are vulnerabilities in this really easily uh, based on software components and so forth so but no s bombs means no fun right I love some of this stuff. I really want, I tried to make this uh, image like the dystopian future, dark gray, and um, the the training for the AI models at Midjourney was not picking up that I wanted this to be dirty and gritty no matter how many times I told it. And it came out really happy and bright and green and very cartoony for all these dogs. No, I wanted like, like wolves that were gonna tear Bob's head off. And now nah, there's some nice puppies here, so. I did the best I could. All right. But so if we can't get ready access to it, we got to go about this, do this hard way. And well, brain surgery is fun, right? Yeah. Just ask uh, Buckaroo Banzai, uh, Adventures of Buckaroo Banzai in the Eighth Dimension. Hey, this was how some of this uh, AI prompt ended up. I uh, told uh, Mid Journey that I wanted Bob the Minion to go undergo brain surgery by Buckaroo Banzai. Um, have the surgeon be Buckaroo Banzai. Uh, unfortunately, it actually crossed uh, Peter Weller uh, with uh, a minion and came up with this abomination. Uh, it's quite amazing. Like, this is the best of them. Uh, the other ones were just downright terrible. Uh, also, if you've never seen uh, Bucker, uh, the adventures of Buckaroo Banzai in the 8th Dimension, 
I highly recommend that you do so. It is a 1980s, very campy film with some really amazing stars. Um, Peter Weller, John Lithgow, uh, a whole host of folks. And it's it's amazingly campy and maybe one for uh, Jeff Moss to send to Hacker Movie Night. Because it's, it's hilarious and it, it's great. Um, it's on the, what, the top thousand movies you should see before you die. And like number 43 uh, in um, some of the, the campy sci-fi movies uh, top lists and, and so forth. So uh, my plug. And, and uh, note that Bob doesn't even have yellow ears in this one. They're apparently Peter Weller's ears. Not only did they do a brain transplant, they did an ear transplant too. All right, so let's get to this brain surgery. All right, take this thing apart. We do this the hard way. Uh, pull the boards out, do an inventory, take pictures of all the chips. Uh, let's do some uh, some analysis and figure out uh, some uh, of the spec sheets, go download those, and then start figuring out how we can get access to that firmware. Uh, are there serial ports available on the board? Yes, yes, in this case there is. I did not go that route, however. Uh, can we use uh, JTAG or SWD to dump firmware from uh, from the device, from that bus? Uh, I fortunately did not have to go down that road either because that is arguably the harder. Um, but what about uh, SPI uh, and, and being able to grab that from there? Uh, the first question was uh, looking at the processor. It's a, an RTL 8198D uh, featured here in this slide. Uh, and I figured I was probably going to have to go use JTAG, have uh, the processor with internal memory and have to dump it from internal memory and so forth, but not so much. Okay. Uh, but what I did find on the board was um, a Winbond uh, W25N01GV, uh, which is a 3 volt, 1 gigabit flash chip. But they said 128 meg. No, 1 gigabit available on this board, and they're only using 128 meg of it, according to what they're saying. Yeah, so there's a lot more room on this. Yeah, why? I don't know, because they're cheap, honestly. Uh, ask me how I know this. We'll see this in a little bit here. Um, so uh, SPI, uh, and it is uh, NAND. So, all right, this will be interesting. And uh, apparently Bob is really hungry for some chips. All right, so I had to go now get this flash off of this Winbond SPI flash chip. And there was very much of progression of frustration going through, uh, going through this. So uh, this is what society thinks I do when I remove firmware from a chip. Uh, credit to Wired uh, and uh, IBM here, uh, sorry, Intel, uh, in uh, some of their photographs about doing some really great work with a microscope and all sorts of fun stuff. And you'll note uh, I'm sort of featured down here in the right-hand corner looking very studious and uh, doing a really great job of removing firmware, uh, what society thinks I do. Um, this is what my friends think I do, uh, using the PC bytes and um, I'm starting to look a lot worse and maybe a little bit nerdier and geekier. And yes, this is my disaster of a desk and home office. And you get to see also the other fun stuff in the background. So uh, this is what my friends think I do, right, Mick? Yeah. All right. Um, this is what I think I do. Uh, this is also one of my attempts. Uh, soldering wires directly to the flash chip and then holding it down with some tape. This didn't work either. Okay, um, so I'm uh, getting worse and worse in my uh, my studiousness here, uh, and ultimately, uh, this is what I really did. Okay. Uh, I now look like a really big goober, uh, and I actually had to remove the chip from the board and put it in like a three dollar adapter from Amazon, uh, and use some uh, some Dupont wires and attach it to a Raspberry Pi, uh, and use that uh, I/O on the board for the Raspberry Pi. Yeah, and just reuse the PC Bytes thing to hold my Raspberry Pi because I was too lazy to take it off my desk. So, yeah, I actually had to do uh, take the chip off of the board because I couldn't get any of the other stuff to work right. And it may not have been the fact that there was anything wrong with my PC Bytes or with my solder job, uh, but I do know that I bricked the one that I did the solder job to. No longer functions. Um, and we'll see why that maybe it wasn't actually the PC bytes or my solder job that wasn't allowing me to get access to the stuff. We're out of time. We're out of time? Yeah, we're out of time. Oh, yes. uh, see, I thought I had an hour. Okay. I will, I, I'll get out of your head here. Let's, uh, I'm going to do these slides real quick here. What I really did, um, not a lot of flash armor support, found some stuff, uh, got a dump, found some treasure, lots of exploits. 
uh, lots of exploit intelligence, lots of remote code vulnerabilities, um, passwords, username Bob, password Bob, other stuff in Korean language, um, some key material, uh, a horrible web app that they wrote their own web server with some pa uh, possible uh, command injection via the password reset function, a bunch of scripts going to IP in China, um, all sorts of other fun stuff. And I really want to do the brain transplant to fix the one that I broke. And I've had no luck. I spent a week on the struggle bus with that uh, because the NAN support that I needed has no write support. So coming soon. All right. Um, I'm out of here. I'm going to, uh, if you want to uh, catch me in the back or uh, over in the IIT village, I'm happy to do some more. Uh, but I want to say thank you and a big thank you to my coworker, Edwin Shuttleworth, who is all now so now a uh, minion as well. So thank you very much and apologies for taking an extra uh, moment of your time. And I'll see you over at the IoT Village. We'll be right up front here uh, if you've got any questions and you want to see some more of these slides and some of the URLs.